Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. For many reasons, I think we are so fortunate to live at this time in the world's development. And one of the things I enjoy is photography. And I hope that you will take time after the service to take some pictures of Cora and the whole lot of you here in church. One of the things I remember when I was thinking about this was a picture in one of our photograph albums, which my mother took at a family gathering. We had traveled to stay in a hotel, and at that time we had two teenage daughters and a, a preteen boy. Mother took a picture in the room the girls were staying in, and it was a picture of no less than 13 pairs of shoes. Did I pay for them all? My mother couldn't believe that she had two granddaughters who had that many pairs of shoes which all needed to come on holidays, and probably secretly wondered if her granddaughters were metamorphosing at night into centipedes. Our gospel passage today has also advice on footwear, if you noticed. And you'll be pleased to read that footwear is allowed. We are allowed to wear sandals to serve God. There is no need to go bare feet. But on the other hand, we are not told to take 13 pairs of shoes either. It's not part of the essential equipment to be one of Jesus' disciples, to have lots of luggage. But who wants to be one of Jesus' disciples anyway? Is it not a specialist job for those 12 whom Jesus called? True, he called 12 by name and called them apostles. But then there were many more disciples, many women amongst them who don't get such a big mention, but when they are mentioned, it is very significant. Jesus stirred up the countryside, all right. He unsettled people. He challenged them. He made them think in a new way about God and about themselves. And those who spend time to listen for God's voice today are still finding plenty of challenge and support through these stories through God's voice, speaking through those stories. What do we want for our children? Yes, we want them to be safe and well. We want them to succeed in life. We want them to gain a good education and find something in their lives that, they, that fulfills them and uses their talents to the best. But do, do we not also want them to be able to think for themselves and live a life practicing kindness, fairness, and love. Jesus came himself from a very traditional Jewish family. As the oldest boy, he learned the trade of the householder. Joseph became a carpenter. When Jesus leaves home to follow John the baptizer, his family is not pleased. In fact, Mark tells us that they go after him because they think that he's entering dangerous waters, and so he was. He was playing with fire, stirring up people and challenging the religious and political authorities. But Jesus, though they think he's gone mad, refuses to come home with them and calls those around him his family, his brothers and sisters. Today, we find Jesus in his hometown, and you might have thought that gave him home advantage. But on the contrary, familiarity soon breeds contempt. After an initial admiration for his wisdom, they fall back into the old ways. Do they only remember a precocious boy who was chasing the hens and occasionally showed disrespect to his elders? What it, was his lineage a problem? Jesus himself 
is reported to be astonished at their lack of faith, their inability to let the past be past and open their ears to the new message he had for them. Now, don't get me wrong. These people had no problem to accept miracles or healings, which we might be struggling with. But the problem for them was they could not see past the old experiences. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus had about three years to teach and preach, to heal and give many disturbed and hurt people a new way of living before he was captured, tried, tortured, and crucified. That could have been the end. But it was those hapless, sometimes hapless disciples, women amongst them, women in fact at the forefront, who, had, who should have had the sense of shutting up and be quiet, but instead began talking about experiences of Jesus alive, Jesus giving them new hope, Jesus giving them strength and guidance for their lives. And now, he really was sending people out. He sends people out to make disciples, to teach them what God had said through him, teach them about love, forgiveness, how to live a life of service and love themselves. And those who follow in Jesus' footsteps are doing just that today, as we are doing today in Chorus Baptism. Jesus gave the disciples authority to teach and preach, to heal and console, and he still gives his followers the command that as we are able, we are to do the same. We do not need to take much on this journey staff and sandals, or their modern equivalents. He recommends that on this mission of teaching and preaching of living God's love, we are to travel light. There is no need for us to keep up with the Joneses. And that should be a relief for us indeed. Yes, we might become people who are criticized because we're not looking right, because we're not doing right. But what is better than living love and justice? And can we complain when our Lord was persecuted and rejected and criticized by many? Those who live in the Spirit of God will gain strength time again, every time they need it but they won't get God's spirit in advance, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer pointed out. Often our weakness, troubles and suffering will make us ask why. You maybe saw the picture of the flowers on the beach in Tunisia last week with the sign saying why on it. And there is no answer. Hatred is blind. And when it rules a human mind, all reason is abundant. But the only thing which will overcome hatred is love. Anything else will lead to more violence, more hatred. Only love has the power to heal, and that love comes from God. Those who follow Jesus' example, those who become his disciples, will experience growth, spiritual growth inside them, and will experience growing in the ways that we want all our children to grow. They will experience the growth of love and joy, peace and forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control amongst them. Let me close by telling you an Arabian fable. This is a story from Arabia. A man wandered one day into the forest, and there he found an injured fox. The fox had been hunted. He was hunted to the extent that he had struggled terribly to get away from the huntsman and broke his leg in the effort. 
so he struggled to hide himself in some bushes. And there he lay and was getting hungrier and hungrier. When the man saw him, he watched and he felt sorry for the fox. But there was another rustle in the bushes. And when he looked, a bear came out of the bushes. And the bear had just caught his supper and was eating a dead animal. And when he had filled his stomach, he left the remains of his meal quite close to the injured fox and shuffled off. The fox devoured the meal hungrily. The next day, the man went back into the forest to check how the fox was doing. And again, the bear came and left a tasty morsel for the injured fox lying quite close. So he thought, I must check on it again. And on the third day, the same thing happened. The man thought very deeply about this, about what he had seen, and he thought, my goodness, if God cares so much about the fox, how much more will he care for me, a human being? My faith is far too feeble. I must learn to trust in God more. So the man went into a quiet corner of the forest and lay down praying. Loving Father, the injured fox has shown me what it means to trust you. Now I too commit myself entirely to your care. Just look after me as you looked after the fox. And with that, he lay down and waited for God to act. A day passed, and nothing happened. The man was getting hungry. A second day passed, and still nothing happened. And the man was deeply puzzled. A third day passed, and the man was angry. Father, he cried, you love that little fox more than you love me? Why don't you care for me when I just trust you so much? Why don't you feed me? At last, hunger forced the man back into town. There on the streets, he met a starving child. He railed against God in, and said, Why don't you do something, God? And God replied, I have. I have created you. But you chose to behave like the fox instead of taking the example from the bear. So let us remember our own baptism, baptisms. We are God's beloved children, his family, infinitely precious, forgiven and loved, that we in turn might be ready to love and serve in his name for the healing of this world. Amen.